did was I hired the woman who uh, had portrayed Willis Heather, and she worked with me a bit, and then I just started um, doing some research about Stephen King's work, but also trying to watch other people and visit their books and see what was affected. So then I just did research. to rely on the power of her word, the power of her work to get that across. Say to my students, the father and mother of American poetry is Walt Whitman, who's so completely out there. Yeah. And Emily Dickinson, who's so completely in there. Yeah. yeah. And the way I explain that sometimes to audiences is that, and I think it was Howard Moss that said this, that some poets hold a mirror up to the world and write about that, which is Whitman. And then some people hold a mirror up to themselves and write about their own personal issues, which is kind of stupid. So I think that's a useful um, metaphor. Are you an English teacher? High school? College? High school. Yeah. Yeah. About three blocks up the road. Yes. Right. How is life as a high school teacher? Runs the gamut, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> is it usually high school? Do I need to be mic'd up? Oh, he put these right here for you. Oh, so, so that they can hear me? That they, should be, they should be. Something I think needs to be turned. Oh yeah, I think I think we have a mic for you. Oh. Yeah. So. Good evening, everyone. I wondered what sort of crowd would come to the library on a Saturday night, but it's uh, thrilling to see that there are people who love to learn and not out doing something else. Uh, so that something else which is now legal in, um, yeah. in Colorado, I find sort of mystifying being from West Virginia. Uh, my name is Deborah Connor, and you may know me from the last day or so that I've been in town. I've been here portraying Zelda Fitzgerald in character in a kind of what's called a Chautauqua-style performance. And now my job is to leave my characterization of Zelda behind and to talk to you in a more scholarly way about the Fitzgerald's life. Let, I'm going to be asking you some thoughtful questions along the way, um, but let me ask you first of all, how many of you knew that F. Scott Fitzgerald, when he died, he died in obscurity. He died a forgotten writer. How many of you knew that? A few of you knew that. Okay. I was an English major in college. I had no idea that that was the case. Um, I assumed that F. Scott Fitzgerald's fame had continued from the time uh, The Great Gatsby was released, well, even before with earlier novels, and that it had remained strong. But that is not the case. And tonight I'm going to talk about what happened in Scott Fitzgerald's life and um, how his public image that he cultivated so assiduously ended up being his downfall. Okay, here's a personal question for you to consider. How many of you have found that you have been defined 
by someone else along in your life as a child or as an adult? Have you been defined as someone who has a certain image, the one who's stubborn, the one who always has your nose in a book, the one who is an athlete, the one who's creative, the one who's good with people? Think about your image of yourself and how that image has come to be. Now think about whether or not that image has been something that you've had to live up to or whether it's something that you've had to live down. Anybody have an insight here that you want to share? It's a little bit personal, I suppose. I always use the example of my brother. My brother's a couple of years younger than I am. But um, in growing up, my brother would never take no for an answer from my parents. And he was so relentless in campaigning for whatever it was that he wanted that my parents had a term for that. It was called the torture treatment because he just kept at it. If he wanted a go-kart or a new bicycle or whatever, he kept at it despite their, um, re their uh, no's or their denials or whatever. Well, that sort of became his image in a way, and later on he became, is a rather successful businessman. And maybe there's a connection there between the fact that he didn't take no for an answer and that became part of his identity, and, and it's worked for him in the career world now. I don't know. But the whole point is that Scott became the victim of his public image. It was an image that brought him fame and renown. It made him an icon, but ultimately it trapped him. It caused him to lose his talent, to squander his talent and his self-discipline as a writer. And the crack-up time in Scott's life was a time when he began to realize that. So what is the crack-up? You can see it visually portrayed here uh, using an expression that he himself used, which was that at this time his life was cracked like a plate. His reputation had gone from being one of the most celebrated writers in America to virtual obscurity. In fact, at this time he even offered his agent the opportunity to have um, his work published under another name. He offered to write work under a pseudonym because he felt his own name had become a liability. He was drinking heavily, his, uh, he was broke and in debt. He had also been hospitalized a number of times for uh, what has been uh, diagnosed as maybe inactive TB or more likely chronic alcoholism. At his uh, worst, Scott could drink a quart of gin and 30 beers a day. He has also reached a low point at uh, this stage in, in the mid-1930s because his novel, uh, his last published novel, Tender is the Night, which was published in 1935, it took him nine years to write that novel, by the way, had sold very poorly. And his short stories, which, by the way, were his main source of income, Scott never made much money from his novels. He was a prolific short story writer and his short stories commanded record prices. One short story could command as much as $4,000 and that's how he was making his money. But at this point he's not even selling short stories. He is uh, only 39 years old by the way. One of the uh, leading Fitzgerald scholars has said that Fitzgerald's life mirrors the, or parallels really, what happened in America in the 1920s and the 1930s. The 1920s is a time of optimism, uh, excitement, and then with the stock market crash and also the crash in Scott's life, that turns all upside down. 
So it becomes a, um, a decade of loss, the 1930s. Now, the crack up specifically refers to three different articles that were published in Esquire magazine in 1936, February, March, and April. And uh, they, have, they go by three different titles, the crack up, pasting it together, and handle with care. One essayist has described these articles as part self-autopsy and part funeral sermon. So he's evaluating his life here in these articles. Why does somebody evaluate his or her life? Why does somebody come to that point where they have to assess their life or reassess their life? What prompts that, provokes that? Hit the bottom. Yes, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they use the term bottoming out. Uh, it's often, something provoked by a crisis, by a collapse, by an illness, uh, and that's um, a good way to look at what happened with Scott. I think he hit bottom. So he's looking at his career and the nosedive that it has taken in these articles. He um, wrote these articles in uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina, in November of 1935 at this hotel, the Skyland Hotel, which was described as a kind of a flea bag hotel, although I don't see that so much from this picture. He was living in a cramped room where he was existing on potted meat and crackers, and he had only $11 in the bank. So it was a time of desperation. He also said it was a desperate time because he had been given, um, he had been told by a doctor that he was going to die, which is a little suspect. We don't really think that's true, but in any case, he's been given a second chance at life, and now he's going to evaluate uh, how he's been spending it. I'm going to show you some slides that contain text from these crack up articles and ask you to paraphrase or um, assess what it is that Scott is saying about himself and whether or not you think he's being truthful and ruthless in his self-examination of his life or whether he's just pretending to be examining his life. Because critics kind of disagree on this. So there was not an I anymore, not a basis on which I could organize my self-respect. It was strange to have no self, to be like a little boy left alone in a big house, who knew that now he could do anything he wanted to do, but found that there was nothing he wanted to do. What's he saying here? He's directionless, he's aimless, he's adrift, yes. He's lost his sense of who he once was. I mean, this is a man who had glory, right? <coughs> Has that been very satisfying? Has that led him to live a life of happiness? No. Here's a little more. Suffice it to say that after about an hour of solitary pillow hugging, I began to realize that for two years my life had been drawing on resources that I did not possess that I had been mortgaging myself physically and spiritually up to the hilt. It doesn't seem like there's much artifice there. It seems pretty straightforward and honest. Okay, I think this is one of the, um, the most direct um, of all of the, um, the samples of the text that I will give you. <laughs> skip on to this one. 
I did not, I do not any longer have the post, I'm sorry, I do not any longer like the postman, nor the grocer, nor the editor, nor the cousin's husband. And he, in turn, will come to dislike me, so that life will never be very pleasant again, and the sign, Cave Canum, is hung permanently just above my door. I will try to be a correct animal, though, and if you throw me a bone with enough meat on it, I may even lick your hand. Does anybody know what Cave Canum means? It means beware of the dog. I didn't know that till somebody enlightened me, but that's what it means. What's he saying here? Anybody have a take on this? Yes. Yeah, this is definitely a U-turn for someone who loved being in the limelight, who loved being with people, who loved having the adoration that comes with celebrityhood. And now he's saying, I just, I don't want to be around anyone. I don't even like people. He's indebted to people? Well, he certainly was indebted to a lot of people financially. Um, he owed, I mean, the Fitzgeralds largely got by in the 1930s by borrowing money, not by making money. Well, didn't you say last night that alcoholics blame other people? So if you blame other people, well, they're not going to like you. Right. Especially if they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, Scott's alcoholism is something that he's not really talking about in these essays, but it was a huge factor in his life. Um, and alcoholics, as you're pointing out, want to blame somebody else for their problems. Um, so that was a very convenient scapegoat for Scott, is to say, well, my drinking is the result of other people, and often specifically of uh, Zelda and her illness because at this time, Zelda had been hospitalized. Starting in 1930, Zelda lived um, in mental hospitals for the remaining 18 years of her life. So uh, in 1930, Scott had acquired quite a lot of debt as a result of Zelda's hospitalizations. So it's clear that he's being quite self-pitying here. And uh, one biographer has said that Scott is really begging and pleading for sympathy here. He's trying to recast his public image and create a more sympathetic uh, public image. Now, do you think the public welcomed this kind of revelation? Do you think this was a popular thing to do? No, it was not a popular thing to do. It was not customary at all. We have such a different um, celebrity culture now where I don't I wonder sometimes if you can be a celebrity without having some sordid story attached to you but in this day and age you just did not uh, reveal your public um, um, turmoil in this way so it was um, it created quite a stir and it made many people uncomfortable some uh, writers in, in Scott's circle, some critics said that he never should have done this. Maxwell Perkins, his editor, said that he has damaged his own reputation by revealing this. Perkins said that Scott had invaded his own privacy. And most of Scott's literary friends hated the articles. One friend said that Scott should stop regarding his own navel Hemingway told him, forget your own personal tragedy, Scott, we're all bitched from the start. <laughs> Marjorie Kennan Rawlings said that he should use this material, this anguish, in his fiction instead of uh, airing it publicly. And Fitzgerald later said that he shouldn't have written these uh, articles. Did I tell you what Cave Cana means? I don't, okay, I couldn't remember if I just said that or not. Okay. Um, again, we're going back to the image of 
the Fitzgerald in the public eye. And this is the uh, cover art from Scott's first book, This Side of Paradise. And even though Scott and Zelda were not the models for this artwork, you can see that they've, the characters here very closely resemble Scott and Zelda. So this begins to be fixed in the public mind that they are the same characters in their book and they're living this riotous, good time life of excess. Here's something that Scott said early on in his career. This is 1920, and remember the crack up articles are in the mid-1930s, 1936. So 16 years earlier, Scott realizes the major obstacle in his life is that he needs to write but he's always having such a good time and living this um, glamorous life of parties and fun that it doesn't allow him time to be a writer. How many of you read The Paris Wife? Well, you, I think you get a little glimpse of Hemingway's um, dedication to his art, to his writing. Hemingway, although he was a um, a fairly heavy drinker. He also had very disciplined work habits, and Scott did not. Scott tended to go off. Scott tended to go off on kind of a binge when he drank, and didn't usually work. So this is something that he said early on. That I mean, it should it should have been an epitaph almost for him, an epitaph for his collapse anyway. Now, another way that the um, public's mind became um, associated with Scott's work and this kind of riotous lifestyle was a result of illustrations done by a man named John Held. It's been said that if John Held wrote the illustrations for the age, Scott Fitzgerald wrote the novels of the age. And John Held's illustrations were used in at least two of Scott's, uh, as cover art for at least two of Scott's books. Scott wanted to be a playwright, by the way, and one of his plays, the only play that ever was produced, was something called The Vegetable, which you can see here on the left-hand side. Um, some years ago, I went to the F. Scott Fitzgerald conference, and they had arranged for a theater troupe to do a production of The Vegetable. And it made perfect sense. What better audience could you have than a group of Fitzgerald scholars coming to see this play, which at the time it was done by Scott, it was a total flop, a total disaster. It closed after, I think, one or two performances. So they set it up all the scholars are going to go to this play. I didn't go because I had something else to do. It was such a failure, even in the eyes of the Fitzgerald scholars, that they left in droves. Some of them walked home in the dark along the highway for a couple of miles to get away from this play. So that's how successful uh, Scott was as a playwright. But nevertheless, John Held's illustrations were used on the cover for the play and also on the cover of, um, of another book of his short stories. So this is again labeling him, giving him the image of being frivolous and not very serious. Uh, the writer John O'Hara said in 1961 that this kind of cover art was one of the worst things that ever happened to Scott because they gave the impression that his work could not be taken seriously. Another downfall on the part of the Fitzgeralds was that they sought publicity. I mentioned in my portrayal that William Randolph Hearst hired a reporter to follow the Fitzgeralds around and to report on everything that they did. This is the cover of Hearst's International Magazine in May of 1923. And you'll see some things pasted over top of it because this picture 
came from Zelda Fitzgerald's scrapbooks. So those are her um, sketches and writing that are pasted over top of the cover. They were in the news. They made the news. They were on the cover of magazines routinely. And I've often said that it reminds me a good bit of uh, growing up in the 60s and finding the uh, Kennedy's picture on all the magazines. Look and life were in my household as I grew up, and the Kennedys were always on the covers, mostly on the covers, certainly inside. Now I wonder who are these celebrities whose pictures routinely appear on the covers of magazines? Who is it? Kardashians. I know. That's what I was hoping someone would say, the Kardashians. When I go through the supermarket line and look at the magazines, the Kardashians are on the cover of the magazines. Who are the Kardashians? What have they done? What is it that's noteworthy about the Kardashians that they get to be on the covers of, of those tabloid magazines? I was um, on vacation and had to do some laundry in a, a laundromat, and they had a whole show dedicated to discussing the Kardashians' divorce in the day. I don't, I don't get it, but I know there are segments of my, um, of my life that I just, or segments of popular culture that I've just skipped over somehow, and I guess it's the Kardashians. It's been said that the Fitzgeralds were the first tabloid personalities. The um, caption for this, which isn't part of this slide, is that, um, the following. Mrs. F. Scott Fitzgerald started the flapper movement in this country. So says her husband, the best loved author of the younger generation. You should also keep in mind that magazines were far more influential in the 1920s than what they are now. Now that's been supplanted by television and, and of course the internet. But magazines were everything in uh, getting an image embedded in people's minds. Here are some other Scott and Zelda photos. Zelda sometimes said she didn't have any interest in fashion, but I find that hard to believe by looking at her clothes. This is a poem that I uh, use in my uh, portrayal that Scott wrote, which I think is very revealing about their life and how they were viewed. There's uh, the Fitzgeralds with their daughter, Scotty. Someone pointed out to me not long ago that Scotty even looks like Caroline Kennedy. This is another page from Zelda's scrapbook when they were living on the French Riviera. They lived there during, for the first time, during the time that Scott was working on The Great Gatsby. And at that time, Zelda developed something of a friendship, maybe romantic interest with a French aviator named Edouard Yosean. How many of you have read The Great Gatsby? Okay. You know The Great Gatsby story is that Daisy is a lost love, and uh, Gatsby tries to recapture her. Well, it's unclear whether Zelda actually had an affair with the French aviator, Edouard Yosean, but Scott believed that there was something going on between them, and he wrote in his, in his diaries, something had happened that summer that could never be repaired. So that sense of loss was, became part of the novel, The Great Gatsby. This is Paris, the Fitzgeralds in Paris in 1925, and Scotty, their daughter, who I mentioned uh, last night died in 1986 of esophageal cancer. She was born in 1921. She always said this was her favorite photo. I like what uh, one of Zelda's biographers said about this photo. She said, they were still doing high kicks but they were already falling. Now 
Now, we've talked a bit about Scott's drinking, and it's interesting to try to look at what changed him from the kind of drinker who has a good time drinking, is um, enjoying that social life that involves drinking, and when that turns the corner to becoming alcoholism. Those of you who read The uh, Paris Wife, were you conscious of how much mention there was of drinking and partying? This was part of their way of life for sure. It's often believed that Scott's drinking changed when he met this man, Ring Lardner. Anybody ever heard of Ring Lardner? He's not an, an author who's well known now, but in his heyday, he was quite a well known author. He wrote short stories, he wrote sports articles, and he wrote for the Ziegfeld Follies and made lots and lots of money. When Scott and Zelda were living out on Long Island, he was their neighbor. He was 11 years older than Scott, and he and Scott became close drinking buddies. Scott even referred to Ring Lardner as his own private drunkard. Now, Scott had been bragging about his drinking. Early on in 1926, he is quoted in a New Yorker article as saying, don't you know that I'm one of the most notorious drinkers of the younger generation? He also published another article in the New Yorker where he tells his life stories in terms of the alcoholic beverages that he's consumed. And he took pride in introducing himself as, I'm F. Scott Fitzgerald, the well-known alcoholic. So at first, it's kind of funny. He thinks it's amusing, but it doesn't stay funny for long. Scott became the kind of drunk whose personality changes. He uh, became abusive to Zelda on a couple of occasions. He became abusive to the other woman that he lived with, uh, Sheila Graham, and I'll talk about her. He um, was once on a bus, and there was a woman sitting in front of him, and he started uh, complimenting her, sort of behind her back, saying, oh, your clothes are so lovely and you're so stylish. And she turned around and smiled at him, and he said to her, oh, you stupid bitch. The woman he lived with late in his life, Sheila Graham, who I just mentioned, they never married. And after Scott died, and he died in her apartment, I'll talk about that uh, in a little while, she turned over a picture of herself that had been sitting on a table, and when she turned it over and looked at the back side, she found that Scott had written on the back of that picture, this is the portrait of a prostitute. Some others in Scott's circle of friends, Ernest Hemingway, uh, you are familiar with him, I'm sure, and became more familiar with him if you read The Paris Wife. He was uh, a heavy drinker also. He was a few years younger than Scott, four years younger than Scott, but Scott really looked up to Hemingway. He liked his masculine image, and Zelda resented that. She felt that he should be, Scott should be who he was and not try to model himself after anyone else and didn't like the fact that Scott always seemed to be looking to Hemingway for his approval. I also mentioned in my portrayal of how cruel Hemingway was to Scott after he became famous. In the first published version of Hemingway's short story, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, he mentions Scott Fitzgerald by name in that story. He, and he mentions poor Scott Fitzgerald, he was wrecked. And later on when, him, when Scott protested that, Hemingway went back and changed the name to Julian, but the damage was already done. Scott said of his eroding self-confidence in the wake of Hemingway's success, he said, I talk with the authority of failure, earnest with the authority of success. 
Hemingway really disliked Zelda and the feeling was mutual. We're not really sure where that animosity comes from. It's been speculated that Hemingway may have tried to seduce Zelda and when she rebuffed him, he uh, turned bitter and vindictive. Another in their circle was the poet and the St. Vincent Millay. There's a story about Millay appearing to do a poetry reading, I think in New York in the 1930s, and they couldn't find her. When they finally found her, she was in the men's room drinking, and they managed to get her out on stage, and she couldn't stand up. So they got a stool for her, and she announced to the audience, I have some standing up poems to read and some sitting down poems to read, and tonight I'm going to read the sitting down poems. And she did. She read them unsteadily from a chair. Her uh, poem, First Fig, is one that I sometimes use in my portrayal of Zelda because I think it's such an eloquent statement about her life and Zelda's life, too. And First Fig goes like this. Oh, I just suddenly... Oh, here we go. My candle burns at both ends, it will not last the night. But ah, my friends, and oh, my foes, it gives a lovely light. Another of the group that was really not part of the Fitzgerald Circle, but a renowned writer of this time, William Faulkner, also was um, well known for his hard drinking habits. Um, just going back to Hemingway for a second, it's been pointed out, I thought this was kind of interesting, I read this recently. You, you probably know that Hemingway took his own life. Um, did you know that his brother and sister also took their own lives? And Hemingway's father took his own life. And some people have pointed out that it seems as though Zelda's life is defined by her mental illness, but that is not what people know about Hemingway. So that is that really fair? Okay, uh, one of the final indignities in Scott's life came when he's 40 years old on his 40th birthday and a reporter by the name of Michael Moak came to interview him. This is 1936, September 25th, Scott's 40th birthday, and the reporter stayed for a couple of hours, and Scott thought that the interview had gone very well. He was looking forward to seeing something um, in print about himself, something complimentary. But this is what appeared the next day. And I know you can't read the text. You can probably read the headline. The other side of paradise, Scott, 40, engulfed in despair. Underneath that, it says, broken in health. He spends birthday regretting he had, that he has lost faith in his star. He goes on, Michael Moe goes on to portray Scott as a drunk with the, quote, pitiful, expression of a cruelly beaten child. He spends his days, as he spends all his days, trying to come back from the other side of paradise, the hell of despondency in which he has writhed for the last couple of years. You can imagine how wounding this was to Fitzgerald. One of his contemporaries said when this article came out, in that it was as if Scott were already dead. Now I put something in here that really doesn't have anything to do with the crack up, but I find this so fascinating I just can't resist not sharing it with you. The cover art for the novel, Scott's novel, The Great Gatsby, was done by a man named Francis Cugat. Is that a name that anyone knows? Cugat? Anybody know that name? Xavier. Xavier Cugat was a band leader, and his brother was an artist. Xavier, or sorry, Francis Cugat was born in Spain in 1893, 
and he worked as a designer. It's, no one knows what happened to him. There's no record of his uh, date of death or what happened to him uh, along the way. But he was asked to create the cover for The Great Gatsby. Cugat created this cover without ever seeing the manuscript for The Great Gatsby. And it's now believed by some people that Scott saw the cover art that Cugat had created and wrote the, the story of The Great Gatsby to match the cover art in some ways. Where, you know, the opposite is usually true. The manuscript is created first, then the cover art follows that. Well, it may not have worked like that. Scott wrote some of the emotion from the cover into this, into The Great Gatsby. What you see here is a face, supposedly daisies, but also Zelda's. And what you probably can't see from a distance are these um, images of a woman's form caught in the irises of the eye of this woman. It shows, the cover art shows the glittering spectacle of their lives, yet there's this looming sadness over the whole thing. And to make it even more eerie, one of Scott and Zelda's friends, the writer John Dos Passos, there's no, oh by the way, there's no carnival scene at all in The Great Gatsby. But John Dos Passos describes a time when he and Scott and Zelda were out house hunting on Long Island and they stopped because there was a carnival going on and Zelda wanted to ride the Ferris wheel. Scott stayed in the car with a bottle and John Despasos and Zelda got out and rode the Ferris wheel. And this is what Despasos wrote later. He said, the gulf that opened between Zelda and me sitting up on that rickety Ferris wheel was something I couldn't explain. I had come up against that basic split in her mental processes that was to have such tragic consequences. So this is almost like a visual premonition of what's going to happen in the Fitzgeralds' lives, but none of that was on the horizon when this cover art was created, or when Scott was writing The Great Gatsby either. If you're lucky enough to own a pristine cover, uh, first edition with the dust jacket intact, how much do you think that would bring you at auction? Oh, $100,000. How about that? The original painting for this cover was thrown away in the trash at Scribner's during one of their clean-out processes, and someone retrieved it and gave it to a member of the Scribner family, Charles Scribner III, who donated it to Princeton. I I'm sure it's worth a fortune. Now, I've mentioned uh, Scott's later years and how he became involved with a woman named Sheila Graham. Just to give you a little context for their relationship, Scott went to Hollywood to work in the late 1930s. He dies in 1940, but the last few years of his life, he worked in Hollywood, and he made enough money to get out of debt. He didn't get in the black very much, but at least he repaid a lot of the debt that he owed by working for the movies. While he's in Hollywood, he meets this woman named Sheila Graham, who is a, a Hollywood gossip columnist or journalist um, of some merit and renown, and they begin to have a deep and lasting relationship. Sheila Graham manages to get Scott sober, and he stays sober for a couple of years late in his life. Some people have pointed out that she looks like Zelda. I don't know that I really um, agree with that all that much, but in any case, you might be able to make your own assessment of that. We don't know whether Zelda knew anything about Scott's involvement with Sheila Graham. We do know that he um, refused to give her 
his address and phone number in Hollywood. What do you ladies think? Would you, would you, would you be a little suspicious if your husband was on the other coast and he didn't want to give you his phone number or his address? Keep in mind, Zelda was in Highland Hospital, the mental hospital in North Carolina, so she wasn't exactly in a good position to, to ask too many questions. This um, relationship, however, was known by Scotty, Zelda and Scott's daughter, who was 16 at the time. She knew that her father was involved with and living with Sheila Graham, and Scotty approved of the relationship. Scotty felt that her father needed someone to take care of him, so she was delighted that Sheila Graham was doing that. Some of you may have seen a movie called Beloved Infidel with, that, um, that is about this relationship. I think it's Deborah Carr who plays Sheila Graham, and Gregory Peck plays Scott, which I think is terrible miscasting. Scott was blonde and Gregory Peck is dark, but um, the kind of, I don't know, scandalous movie, but uh, it came out in the 1950s. Sheila Graham wrote a memoir about her time with Scott called Beloved Infidel, and that's where the story comes from. Here's another picture of Sheila Graham. There's a heartbreaking story about a time when Sheila Graham and Scott are together, and Scott hears that the Pasadena players are doing a version of one of his short stories called A Diamond as Big as the Ritz. Scott decides and, that he and Sheila are going to give these amateur players the thrill of their life. He's going to rent a limousine, he's going to get out his tux, Sheila's going to wear her furs, and they're going to appear at this production of the Pasadena Players, Diamond as Big as the Ritz. They're going to give them the thrill of their lifetime because the actual author is going to show up that night in a limousine, unbeknownst to them. It's going to blow them away. Well, Scott and Sheila get there in their finery, step out of the limo, and they find that the production of the Diamond as Big as the Ritz at the Pasadena Playhouse is in a tiny room upstairs. And they wander in, and there are about 12 people sitting on benches to see this production. That was one of the final slaps for Scott. Now, I mentioned this the other night, last night, in my portrayal, too, about what's going on in the life of Zelda and her family and Scott's um, continued denial of his alcoholism. Zelda's family blames Scott and his actions for causing Zelda's mental illness. But Scott blames Zelda's mental illness for causing his alcoholism. So there's a whole lot of tension and blame going on here. And this is the last known photo of Scott taken about a year before he died. That's Scott on the left and he is with the writer John O'Hara. John O'Hara said that Scott should have been killed in a Bugatti, that's a race car, he should have been killed in a Bugatti in the south of France and not have died of neglect in Hollywood, a prematurely old man haunting bookstores unrecognized. In the last year of Scott's life, the great Gatsby and all of Scott's novels made him a total of $13.13. .13. That was the total amount of his royalties when he died in 1940. Today, Zelda's and Scott's heirs, which are grandchildren, receive benefits from a trust, and the, his novels and other, the Great Gatsby and other works earn that trust about $500,000 a year. Scott says uh, at one point in his writings, there are no second acts in American life, but he certainly has one. When Zelda and, after Scott died in 1940, Zelda and Scotty need money. 
So they offered to sell Princeton. Scott went to Princeton. He didn't graduate, but he uh, stayed through most of his third year. He wasn't, he was flunking almost all of his courses, including English. So uh, when, but he still had a strong attachment to Princeton. And so Scott and Zelda offer Princeton 52 cartons of Scott's papers saying, you know, these should be valuable. Would you like to buy them? I think they ask $1,500 for those 52 cartons of books. And this is what Princeton says in reply to their inquiry. Princeton has no obligation to squander funds on the indigent widow of a second-rate Midwestern hack who happens to have been lucky enough to have gone to Princeton. That was their assessment of Scott Fitzgerald when he died. One of Scott's biographers, Andrew Turnbull, who, later, who knew Scott and later on went to Princeton, asked permission to write his honors thesis on Scott's work, and Princeton told, that, told him that Scott Fitzgerald was not significant enough as a writer to merit uh, this, to be the subject of a, um, an honors thesis. So that's Scott's reputation when he dies. But he makes a comeback. One of the most amazing stories in literature. And it's, it's still a little bit baffling to people as to how that happened. When Scott died, a number of prominent writers began to write tributes to him. And people began to take notice of his work. People who had neglected his work or ignored his work for a long time began to read it again. There's also the belief that the climate in the 1950s, when Scott's reputation made a comeback, the climate in the country was very similar, 1950s post-war optimism, was very much like it was in America in the 1920s. So maybe that accounted for his comeback. But in any case, Scott's work is now considered, maybe, with the, as far as The Great Gatsby is concerned, one of the great American novels, if not the great American novel. Um, and you know, we can all rejoice in the fact that, that something like this happened to such a talented writer who, who by all uh, assessments, was going to die in oblivion, obscurity, and forgotten. There's a new book that I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I think it's worth mentioning. Has anybody listened to NPR, the book critic Maureen Corrigan? She's just come out with a book titled, And So We Read On, which is a play on the last line of great, the Great Gatsby's last sentence is, and so we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. That's how The Great Gatsby ends. Maureen Corrigan's new book about The Great Gatsby is titled, and so we read on, and she is looking at the lasting importance of The Great Gatsby. So you might want to look that up. I definitely want a chance to have a chance to read that soon. I also like to quote from the novel The Great Gatsby because there's a point in the novel when um, Gatsby says, you can't repeat the past? Of course you can. Well, that's really essentially what happened with Scott. His past success came back after an utter and complete collapse of his reputation. So it is quite phenomenal. Well, that's about the, all the information I have for you, but I would welcome the chance to answer any questions that you might have. I know I've probably left gaps in, uh, in things that I should have told you and didn't. There's one in the back. If self pitying, they're somewhat confessional, like he's, yeah, confessional. My question is, was he trying to make atonement to anybody, to anything, to whom, or what, to what? Well, 
his um, crack up essays are read in a number of different ways. Was he trying to make atonement or apologize to others? I don't see that myself. I think he's just feeling sorry for that. My sense is that they're over overwhelmingly self-pitying. Um, he doesn't seem to take much responsibility for his actions and his misbehavior and his waste of talent. That's what Hemingway said. Um, he said, Scott has wasted his lovely golden talent. And that's probably pretty accurate. He did that. Why is Zelda called? She's considered mentally ill, but why is he considered mentally ill? Why is he called drunk? Why is he considered to be mentally ill? Was Scott mentally ill? Yeah. Mm, I don't think so. He was a chronic alcoholic, but I don't know that there's any mental illness factor. Yes. Did Scott's family give him any advice about what to do with his money, well, how to invest it well? Well, Scott's father worked for a furniture company. As he was growing up, he worked for a furniture company and then went to work for Procter & Gamble. He lost his job, and the family, which was pretty solidly mental, middle class, um, fell into poverty except for some family money that his mother had. Her father was a grocer, and she had some, a uh, little bit of an inheritance, which the family used to sustain themselves. So they had been living in an area of St. Paul that was um, the more upscale area, but they lived on the fringes of it, and they struggled and struggled to maintain that image of having something when they really didn't have much at all. So Scott grew up being money conscious. And his family, um, by the time he left home, his family pretty much had cut their ties with him. He, he didn't like um, the fact that his mother had had to rescue, he felt pity for his father, and he resented the fact that his mother's money had to sustain the family. So they didn't give him any advice on how to, how to invest wisely. Someone has asked me from time to time if the stock market crash in 1921 affected the Fitzgeralds. Well, not a bit because they didn't have any money invested. What can you tell us about their life in Paris? What can I tell you about their life in Paris? Well, if you read The Paris Wife, you know that it was a time when they became part of the salon culture under Gertrude Stein. And Hemingway was championed by Gertrude Stein. She promoted his work. She thought highly of Scott's work. But um, eventually, Gertrude Stein turned away from Hemingway because she thought he was cruel to other writers. Scott and, and Hemingway at that time were becoming more and more rivals. Initially, Scott, who was a renowned writer at that time, was helping to get Hem Hemingway's career launched. But the competition between the two became a very serious source of friction. And the fact that Hemingway didn't like Zelda just added to things. But yet Scott kept looking for Hemingway's approval on a lot of things. There's a letter that is, has been retained where Scott has written to Hemingway after the publication of A Farewell to Arms. And he praises the book, but then he suggests about 50 things that he, sh he felt should have been cut in a farewell to arms. And at the bottom of the letter, Scott's letter to Hemingway, Hemingway scrawled, go to hell, Scott. Which, you know, that it wasn't very diplomatic of Scott to be criticizing a farewell to arms after it had already been published. 
but that just gives you a sense of their relationship. Yes. Did Zelda have close friends of her own, or were they mainly Scott's friends? Mostly her friend, Zelda didn't really have a lot of close friends. That may have been something to do with her illness, uh, because when she began to, her mental condition began to erode, she became more and more withdrawn. It's claimed that Zelda liked men, she liked the company of men, and didn't have much use for women. So she didn't have a lot of supporters in her life and that was only enhanced by the fact that she grew up in Montgomery, Alabama and was uprooted and taken to New York to live when she married Scott. So she left the people she knew and the life she knew behind. She was only 19 but that must have been very hard. What mental illness did they think she had? What mental illness did Zelda have? Well she was diagnosed with a variety of things. Most often it was schizophrenia, and she had some of the classic symptoms of schizophrenia. She heard voices being the primary one. But there's also a reason to believe that she experienced uh, periods of depression, which was more characteristic of a bipolar disorder. And now it's believed that Zelda had something called schizoaffective disorder, which is a combination of schizophrenia and depression. Some of Zelda's other doctors, however, gave the most, I think, wacky diagnoses. One of them said that if she just gave up her ambition and was more a conventional mother and wife, she would be fine. Uh, that she had an unhealthy need to compete with Scott and be an artist of her own and she should just give up all of her ambitions and that her illness would go away, which is ridiculous. Um, one doctor suspected that Zelda had a brain tumor, but that could never be confirmed. Another doctor thought there was something wrong chemically with her, and we know now that mental illness is often, uh, a chemical imbalance is part of mental illness. Keep in mind that when Zelda was mentally ill in the 30s, they really didn't know how to treat it they did some of the most brutal and appalling treatments you can ever imagine because it was nothing more than guesswork. It wasn't until the 1950s when this uh, drugs, the psychotropic drugs came out that that all turned around. Another question? Where was Scotty living when her mother was institutionalized? Scotty mostly lived with friends of the Fitzgeralds, most often with Scott's uh, agent, Harold Ober, who had a daughter Scotty's age. And they provided a home for her. They also provided for her financially, paying for some of her tuition at Vassar and some of the expenses of her private schools. She went to private schools to boarding schools as she was growing up because Scott and Zelda really couldn't provide a home for her after she was about 10. One of Zelda and Scott's friends said something that I find memorable. They said Scotty was never a child. She was only a 40-year-old widow. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Anything else? Well, on that cheery note, <laughs> we'll wrap up. I hope you've learned something about the Fitzgeralds. I hope that you've, uh, ta you're taking away something lasting and that uh, you'll appreciate Scott's work. And um, the greatest compliment that I ever have as someone who brings information about the Fitzgeralds is when someone says, oh, I went right out and read a biography or I went right out and read The Great Gatsby. I hadn't read it ever or I hadn't read it for a long time. So I hope that will be true for you. Thank you very much. Leave it on. 
Um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. We have been very fortunate to have Deborah with us for the past two days doing um, several programs. So thank you for all of your work with us. We really enjoyed thank you being here. And um, thank you all. We do have two more weeks left of All Pueblo Reads. We still have a ton of programs and events going on. So if you haven't heard me say it before, we still have some resource guides in the back. Um, please grab one and look through it. We have great events going on. And also, um, next Friday, on the 24th, we have the Madams of Central Colorado that will be here. Um, doors open at 6.30. It's going to be a very fun event, so um, please grab a flyer, and we hope to see you then. And we also have our Book Lovers Black Tie Ball. Um, that is a week from tonight. If you um, still want to get some tickets, we have some left, so you want to run and get those quick. Um, and we hope to see you at some more programs. So, thank you. See if I know how to get this out of here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll leave that to you. Okay. Is this your little zip drive? That is. Okay.